the Gospel of Matthew and chapter 12, verses 43 to 50. There are two events in this passage. We will take them together because it appears to me that God had a very amazing plan in putting these two verses together through Matthew. And uh, there are some wonderful enlightening thoughts that the Spirit of God has for us and we want to receive them with joy today. And so let me uh, read this portion to you if you are all ready uh, with Matthew chapter 12 verses 43 to 50. Uh, follow along as I read. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. And he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out, and when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. The last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Verse 46. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him, and told him, sorry, that told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Firstly, there is a story of a generation of people whom Jesus referred to in a parabolic way as a man in whom was an unclean spirit. Jesus talked about that unclean spirit dwelling a man to talk about the wickedness of the generation, as you see at the end of verse 45. He said, even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. And so we are suddenly awakened by those words of Jesus to the reality, what a wicked generation would be like. <laughs> a wicked generation would also like to look like a morally upright, a beautiful generation. Every generation try to make themselves look good. Isn't it? Even our time. Our people want to be looking good. No matter how they live. They want everybody to think that they are righteous people. They are good. Even though they pursue evil things. They try to make it 
very, very good. <laughs> so the homosexuals will say, we are great lovers. We love others. We love people of our own kind. And our, this is our expression. They will never say it's a wicked lust. And there are those who are, you know, covetous men, greedy men, who would constantly squeeze people until they become so rich. And then they come up with very great charitable work that will make them look like generous. Very generous. Because they give a thousand dollars or, or, or uh, you know, millions of dollars to charities. Actually, they are covetous and greedy and really people who grab money through corrupt ways. There are murderers who justify the murder. Well, this world is like that. And Jesus said, even though devilish forces are at work in this world, even though individuals are guided and led by unclean spirit, they all want to look good from time to time. And the way Jesus said it is beautiful. Let's take a look again. I will come back to verse 43. And when the unclean spirit went away from this wicked generation, which is represented by a man, you know, it is said at the end of verse 44 that when, he, when, the, when finally the demon came back, he saw that that person is empty. That means there is no ugly thing. Swept clean and garnished, made beautiful. It's interesting. A beautiful house. That's how one's demon possessed man looked like. He looked like morally righteous. He looked clean. He looked just fine. But watch the words. Empty. Empty. I think that's very crucial. It's a garnished house. It's put in order. All the ugly looking stuffs are removed. In the sight of those who look at the house, it looks garnished, beautiful. But there is a word that is crucial to our understanding of this parable. It's the word empty. The house is empty. Now let's see what happened. And why is it empty? Look, according to verse 43, it's a situation of a man. We are not told of any particular man. Jesus is telling us a story. What happens in this world. And he says, the unclean spirit is gone out of a man. Unclean spirit. Now that is a proper description of a demon. Demons are unclean beings. They are morally, spiritually, and mind you, even physically quite unclean. When a man is full of sin, he doesn't even have any sense of the dirt and the, and the horrible appearance. Now, some of our wonderful brethren in our midst who look so handsome, so fit, and so clean, and so well uh, pro uh, groomed today. And I saw them a few years ago. They didn't look like that. They were skinny. They were ugly. They were sick. They were vomiting, disoriented because of drug addiction and alcoholism. You wouldn't even want to go near them. 
They stink. They creep into the care ministry. Get some in care ministry. You don't feel like talking to them. They look weird. Think of the brother who gave a testimony yesterday. He wrote down his testimony. And he tells us how the Lord changed him. And he wants to. But he said something very interesting. I'm going to talk to that brother and the rest. All of us at the same time. I'm going to tell you what is truly Christianity and what is not. It is not a garnished house. It's not about having an outward appearance of a system or an institution or a pursuit that we undertake. No, it's all about an abiding relationship with Christ. It's not about the house, but it's about the family relationship you have with Christ. You know, you can live in a garnish house, but the relationship in that house can be all broken, bitter, and ugly. Christianity is not about having a nicely decorated religion, which is morally clean, it seems, for a time. So let's call it self-righteousness. The morality. It is not about stopping smoking or taking drugs or getting drunk or womanizing or living a life like a prostitute. That's not spiritual life. You may stop your ugliness for a while. You may stop all those disorderly, horrible behavior that you had. That doesn't make you a Christian. Even though you want people to think that you are a Christian. So if you put these two stories that we have. Where Jesus explains what is not Christianity. And then he comes to uh, a conversation with the people who said your mother and brothers are here wanting to talk to you. He said who is my mother? Who is my brother? He points to the disciples and these who do the will of my father, which is in heaven. It's about a relationship with God through Christ that really describes what Christianity is. Do not seek for a garnished house, but seek for a strong, intimate relationship with your God. Let me go further. The first story in this passage tells us that the unclean, vile, wicked demon left. May I tell you, when we are without Christ, we are under the influence of the devil. We are devil's children when we are without Christ. Once we were all like that, and we know how ugly the work of the devil is in our heart. We want to do everything that is shameful, wicked, hurtful to others. And we don't even mind to hurt ourselves. Oh, the devilish influence in our heart is so vile. So vile. He's not only vile and he's villain also. He will try to dupe us to do things that are most wicked. Isn't that right? Oh boy. If you have any kind of foul adjectives, I mean, not vulgarity, but, you know, all those adjectives that would talk about vileness, ugliness, you can use it all for a demon. I just wrote down some. Nasty, bad, horrid, dreadful, abominable, offensive. And more, of course, you can add on. <laughs> Repugnant. 
That's what demons are. And you know, they are desperate to get us to do wicked things. And that's why sometimes we see, you know, some youths go so, so far into mindless behavior. They are sometimes brought up by, you know, well-educated parents. They got everything at their disposal. They can choose a good institution to study uh, because the parents are able to support them. But they don't know how to manage their opportunities. They abuse the opportunities given. Sometimes I have heard of parents sending children to Australia, to Canada, to UK, to America to study, but the things that they get into, oh boy, nobody should ever even hear of it. So shameful, so wicked. And they get involved in such nasty situations. And you wonder, how come these children lose their mind? Devilish forces at work. And Jesus here says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man. But he doesn't say how the unclean spirit went out. And so I don't want to guess how it went out. Somehow, this person who has been so terribly affected by the influence of the demon was able to get rid of the influence for a while. Well, I don't want to go to any sort of exorcism ideas at this point. There are people who seek all kinds of ways. And some people sometimes by their own sheer discipline and hard work try to keep such demonic filth that they had for a while in their life away from them. I have seen it. I mean, our Gethsemane Care Ministry is a fantastic laboratory for this. <laughs> what I meant is, you can see it happening. For more than 12 years, I have watched this happening. In fact, I should say more than 30 years I have watched this happening. Because I had some uh, uh, people who were former drug addicts uh, studying with me in the Bible college. And that going straight back into drug addiction and coming to the class to learn theology after taking drugs. Sat next to me, one chap. And he was on drugs. I could immediately feel it. And I don't want to describe what he is doing. It's really disgusting. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's not himself. And I have seen these people trying so hard to kick the bad habits away. And they do succeed for a while. There are people who come to halfway houses, Christian halfway houses, as we call them, those drug rehabilitation centers that we have in Singapore. And they kick their habits. And they manage to sort of reform themselves for a while. And they become sober. They become healthy. Sometimes they go back to their families. They start even working. Boy, they become very confident. And some even challenge me and say, when I warn them, please be careful. You must follow the Lord. I say, don't worry. There is a very intelligent man who was in our care ministry. I wouldn't mention his name. But when I describe, some may know. But I try to make it as obscure as I can. A very intelligent chap. Extreme, extremely intelligent, I must say. Very clever, very enterprising but was really 
really troubled by the intoxicant substances that he was using. He was with our uh, care ministry, and you know, he was, so, he was quite educated, and I was wondering, uh, you know, what would drive him to be in care ministry uh, where, he, you know, we, we put them into work projects like removal services. This guy is an educated fellow. He, he sits on a nice chair and do things. And how would he get himself to do, um, you know, those hard labor, labor? And yet he was so down to earth, he will happily go with all the rest and hardly heard of any quarrel he get into. He was one of the best removal worker that we had. One of the best, from my observation. Not that he's very uh, strong and um, full of muscles, but he worked hard and he had no complaint and he did well. One day his father called me and said, Pastor Gushi, you have done much to reform my son. Uh, would you give him a job in your church? And I wrote back and said, I appreciate what you said, but your son is not a Christian, and therefore I cannot give him any work in my church. Then he said, Pastor Koshi, he can help you. Uh, no need to make him a preacher, but he can help you to do stuff with the computers. He can uh, you know, help you to do your website. He can design your magazine. He has done all these things and more. And uh, I said, I can't. He's not a Christian. He cannot be employed by the church. So the father stopped persuading me. He finally said, nonetheless, I still thank you. And I wrote back and I said, I'm still worried for your son. He looks clean and that he is not clean. He is empty. He got the bad habits out, but look, it's empty. He will soon be occupied. The person who should occupy his heart must be the Lord Jesus Christ, for he alone is the Savior. He alone is the Sanctifier. Otherwise, that empty, garnished life of his will soon be occupied with the same and even worse things. And you know that. He left us for the last six years. He's out in the world. He has a professional job and all that. And sometimes I see in his Facebook, uh, he seemed to have a living in partner. I'm not sure whether he's married. I didn't see any announcement about his marriage, but he, he seemed to have a lady with him here and there. And he seemed to be doing all right, but I don't know. Every year, at least two or three times, he will send a message, either by Facebook or by email. And he will say, Pastor Koshi, I can never thank you enough for all that you have done for me. And you have been a great help. You helped me. I was down and out. I thought I'm going to kill myself. But coming to get some a care ministry and listening to you, it was amazing. You know, there was, a, there was one point before he left. I sat with him, tried to persuade him to believe in Christ. He said, you know, Pastor Koji, you almost made me a Christian. But you are too much to the right for my liking. And that's what he said. You, must, you are too much to the right. So you, what do you want me to be? Left? In the middle? I said, I have to be on the right where the Lord is. He said, I got the point. But I find it very, very difficult to accept in my mind. And so he declared himself to be an animist and left. But even... Just last week, I received another mail from him, a very short message. It's getting shorter and shorter now. And he says, Pastor Koshi, I think you are, I wish all the best for you. 
and I hope that you are doing well. But I'm worried for him now. Very worried. Because that's an empty soul. One thing that I refused to do in Gethsemane Care Ministry is that make it run like other halfway houses. I always said to the people in care ministry, this is not a halfway house. It's an all the way house led by Jesus. We don't lead people halfway or three quarter way. Now they have not only halfway houses, they also have what they call three quarter way. I don't know why they would like to call it halfway. Any idea, anybody? I still don't know. And now they come up with a great idea, three-quarter way, three-quarter way. But it is not the whole way. Why are you one half way or three-quarter? I tell you, what I love to have in our church is this integration of the gospel ministry that we carry out to the drug addicts and ex-criminals into the church where Jesus rules, where we all become one. Now I ask the brethren from care ministry, are you a second class citizen in Gethsemane BP Church? Well, are you part of us? Look at the way they are. Preacher Daniel Lim is a preacher. He was a former drug addict. Calvin Lim, our preacher and deacon. Jeremiah Sim, Reverend Paul Cheng in Melbourne. What's the difference? In them, Christ ended. The life did not remain empty. He dwelt. Jesus became their object of worship. Jesus became the object of the wonderment. Their life was Christ and Christ alone. In him they hid the hope of glory. Dear friends, it's not garnishing our house. I can tell you, and I can tell you to all, you may stop, stop smoking, you may stop womanizing, you may stop pornographic addiction for a while, you may stop Certain bad habits that make you very ugly and miserable. But that is not what Jesus is talking about. You don't have to follow Jesus to stop bad habits. Really, you don't have to. And just because you come to church and stop some bad habits, it doesn't mean you have entered the kingdom of God either. The question is it, is this. Is your life still empty? Or is it now filled with the presence and the dominion of your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ? That is the greatest thing. And it is best described not in terms of knowing Him, or having some acquaintance with Christ, but being in a relationship with Him. Look, what happened when that, does, that is not the case? You are a garnish house, you are swept, and no ugly thing there. You seem to be very happy. You feel like telling everybody, look, I have changed. I went to care ministry. Or I went to that halfway house. Or I went through this program, the meditation technique. I got rid of this stuff for a while. And I'm feeling very good. And everybody say, well done, well done. But what would happen? Jesus has this warning. If you leave your life empty, without the king ruling from your heart, if you have not yielded your life your house, for him to reign supreme and everything to be placed under him, then this is what the danger is going to be. Look at verse 45. 
Then goeth he. Who is this he? The unclean spirit. That wicked, vile, obnoxious, repugnant spirit. He goes and taketh with himself seven other spirits. Good ones or bad ones? More wicked than himself. Wow, that's frightening. You know, this is what happens in the world. The world is filled with reformation senders. Retreat, recuperation senders. Oh, so many type of techniques. You have mental institutions, you have counselors, you have psychologists, you have all sort of uh, meditative practitioners trying to help you. You have this program, that program. Boy, the world was filled with programs to reform people. I remember speaking with a mother who brought her son to this church. That was about 17 years ago. That mother was very desirous to have her son change. He was in his primary school days. The boy had many bad habits. He would go to all these, you know, what do you call, video parlors, you know, those game parlors. He would skip classes. He got into bad companies. He stole money from the parent's wallet. And he started to sell things without parents rea realizing. And the mother said the father had a huge collection of coins. Very, very valuable coins. And he stole all of it. And they lost plenty of money. And the father was a collector of coins. They took him to a child psychologist and put him through it. And it is during that time they came to church. And uh, things were so bad, uh, he was given psychotropic drugs. And he became a guinea pig for trying all sorts of drugs available out there. And this boy was so desperate, having taken all these medications, he would drink like four liters of Coke a day. He's desperate. He runs around. He's really go crazy sometimes. And I wonder what is all oh, they say he's ADHD. No. That boy is just fine. Smart. And the problem is ill-disciplined. No proper discipline. And worst of all, no Christ in that boy. And I tried to tell the mother, you know, you should stop giving him all these drugs. Bring him to church. Come with him. You and your husband, come with him. Grow in the Lord. They had a superficial commitment in the beginning. But they were not willing to follow Christ. And the mother stopped coming and the boy still continued. He loved the church. And there was changes in him. And the father also slowly stopped. And the boy also disappeared. There are so many such stories I can tell. Sincere ones. I mean, first-hand experience. Because some of the people who come to church, they seek a change. They want an honorable life. You know, where me and my children look good. Oh, Pastor Koshi, your son behaved very well, you know. And I notice him uh, leading the choir. Good, huh? Oh, oh I better go to Pastor Koshi's church so my son also will be good. Or my daughter will be like Pastor Koshi's son. Oh, I look at the eldest kids. They are very nice. They are very polite. They are courteous. Oh, I better bring my son also there. Maybe by touching or shaking hand, they will. No! 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 There is no magic here. 
Jesus was fed up with people who come to him with this external religiosity that seek their own personal honor. Let me tell you, we all must surrender first to the king. We must utterly cast ourselves. I am not, I am not at all trying to scorn those who are struggling to get their dear ones in, in a proper lifestyle. I understand the struggle. I, I really want to let you know, I am speaking the truth as it is. I'm not trying to mock anyone. I'm not trying to make any of you feel bad about your efforts. I understand your struggle. I have cried with parents. I have cried with ladies whose husbands are utterly ugly and wicked in their ways. I have seen their anguish. I have cried with children who have fathers and mothers addicted to stuff. I know the pain. And I want to tell you honestly, I will walk with such people as far as I can, but not without Jesus. I can't help them. I'm not a reformer of life. This church is not a transformation house. Our care ministry cannot do anything for drug addicts and the ex-criminals. We have nothing magical in our institution or in our church or in our persons. It's all about allowing Jesus Christ, the creator, the redeemer, to take control of our life. And we enter into an intimate, close relationship with him where he will look at him and rejoice in us because we are in total commitment of love with him. So he can call you mother. Huh. Because in your love for him you behave like a mother. Or like a son. With all the responsibilities of a mother. All the responsibility of a child. With all the responsibility of a father and, or, 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 or a brother or sister. You see, all these roles in our life are not to be defined by your thinking. Our roles in life, whether it's father, mother, brother, sister or husband or wife, all these are God-ordained, isn't it? God has an expectation. God has a design for how we should be in these areas. And if you were to carry that out in your relationship with Christ, Jesus will acknowledge it and he will say, you are my mother, you are my brother, you are my sister. And do you know how to get into that relationship? This is not about trying to kick some bad habits and looking good. What is it? Let's get there. Look at the rest of the passage. Uh, this is what is actually a bit embarrassing kind of situation. Let's say I'm preaching now and suddenly uh, one of you runs in. One of our deacons come down. Your father is outside. He came from India. He wants to see you now. Boy. Oh, yeah, about to finish. Five more minutes. It's a bit embarrassing situation for me. <laughs> Verse 46. While he had talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. They were waiting for a while. Mary and Jesus' half-brothers. When I said half-brothers, what I meant is Jesus didn't have a human father, right? So Mary's children 
through his her marital relationship with Joseph were in a way half brothers in that sense okay so they were there waiting to talk to him and do you know something i don't have the time to go through all the texts to prove this but i i think most of us would easily acknowledge this fact that jesus brothers or mary's children did not believe in jesus christ as the son of god and savior until after his death and resurrection we know of a famous leader of the early church called james jesus brother and all of them came to know the lord jesus as their savior only after his resurrection before that they were not all for in fact they opposed him they even laughed at him on occasions you remember when jesus was dying mary was at the cross right i mean at the foot of the cross to whom did jesus commit mary's care was it to his half brothers no to john to john and that proves that Jesus didn't care much about his brothers when they were unbelievers. He didn't think that they would do a good job as much as John who knows him as a savior. And so here is a situation where Mary is waiting. Of course Mary is a believer. Mary believed the Lord Jesus with all her heart. She has all those wonderful revelation of god through the angels that the child in her is a holy child she believed it with all her heart and she is waiting there with the rest of the children verse 47 one said unto him behold thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee jesus was busy teaching the people but he answered and said unto him that told him, huh? Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? What an embarrassing situation. Who is my mother? Is it because Jesus forgot the name? Or is he disowning Mary? What's happening? Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? Jesus didn't wait for anyone to answer. He stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. So he was speaking in a collective sense about all the disciples who genuinely followed him, and he said, concerning them, my mother, my brethren. It's amazing. It's amazing that we can be considered by Jesus Christ as his mother. Sisters, your womb may not have carried Jesus, even though you would have easily opted for that option if you had a chance <laughs> to be a mother of Jesus. Even though you are not a Jew and no chance of being a brother to Jesus in that sense, in a familial sense. And I'm sure any of us here would be so happy to be born in that family where Jesus was born and have access to him at any time as his brother. You better know Jesus offers you the same privilege today. Not because you are physically related to him, but because he will come to you. And he will tell you, you are my mom. You are my brother. Let me ask you sincerely. Have you been behaving in your life, whether it be at school or at work or in the house or in the ch church, as Jesus' mother and Jesus' brethren.
If you have a brilliant child, who you'll be very proud of that child, isn't it? <clears throat> I must confront a terrible evil that exists in our society. It is this evil that we are given the right to choose who's, who should be our child in these days. If the doctor were to tell you, if the gynecologist will tell you if you're a pregnant woman, that the baby in your womb is going to be a Mongolite child, an underdeveloped child, they will suggest to you to abort that baby and they will encourage you. We have some young couple in our church who were told by their gynecologist to abort the babies because the babies are not going to be healthy when they are going to be born. They are not going to be normal. Because they are going to be abnormal special kids as we call today. They were told to choose to kill the babies as fetus. And if we thought that the baby that is going to be born is going to be a normal child, but after its birth, you find that the child is not as healthy as you like the child to be. You become very disappointed mother and disappointed father. You're upset. You're angry. You curse. You wish you are not a mother. Oh, father, oh, brother of such a person. You despise. There were occasions where in my youthful days, I was given opportunity to take care of some handicapped people. And this happened in Singapore. I tell you, I was so disgusted by some of the relatives who had such disgust for these poor people. I have bathed some of them. I was 24. And a couple of people whom I looked after were older than me. And they can't clean themselves. They are mentally retarded, physically handicapped. And I say, tell you, it is so, so disheartening to me in those days that those who were close relatives were not interested to really attend to them in a gentle and committed way. It was heartbreaking. I, I would not venture any further. In those days, I used to think, if I have a son like this, how would I look after him? When I was given that opportunity to look after uh, particularly one which was very close to me, about three years ago, I met him in a very unique, maybe more than three years, but just about three or four years ago, when I met him after about 15 years, I thought he would never remember him because he has some uh, memory issues. It's not fully developed in his mind. It was a very sad situation in which I met him. And I was in two minds, should I introduce myself or not? And so this is 15 years later, after I look after him, and I bathed him, I tended to him several times. And I went to him, and I stood by his side and looked at him. I didn't want to call him, because I don't know how he's going to react. And I also don't want to feel awkward, and it was a public situation, you know, there are other people. So I was very careful. I stood by him and looked at him. And then he looked intently into my face. Then he frowned. Then he smiled. 
and I bent down. Do you remember me? You are Brother Das. Say, I'm surprised you remember me. He's an old, in an old folks home today. They look after him. In those times, I used to ask him, if I have a son like this, what would I do? Our brethren go to Lion's home, and today's, um, would you please turn to your bulletin. On page five, <clears throat> a letter from Lyons Home. This is a ministry we do every Sunday afternoon. This is from Doreen Lai, Chief Executive Officer of Lyons Home for the Elders. This work began long ago. It started once when I was reading <clears throat> in the Straits Times of the need of the aged people in Singapore, many jumping down from high-rise buildings because they are lonely. I got a young man with a bike in our church to take me to different places to see old people. I went to many old folks' home and many areas where we see old people. I tried to reach out to them. Many shut the door against me because when they hear I'm a pastor, and I want to preach Christ to them, and I want to minister to them. They said, no. Finally, I went to Bedok South, where there is this Lion's Home for the Elders. And the matron was a Christian at that time. And she was overjoyed to see me. She said, please come, please come. I forgot the year we started. Anybody remember? But anyway, that was almost two decades ago. And we serve the Lord with wholehearted commitment, week after week, without fail, unless there is some pro program going on in that place we can't go there. We will go. And today it is led by our preacher Jeremiah Sim and Sister Gina, and together with him, a group of brethren, very, very devoted in going there. I stopped going because of all the work in the church, but I'm glad. Many of you go there, many brothers and sisters. I praise God for you. Read that. The second paragraph in particular. Oh, let me read from the beginning. A blessed and joyous Christmas to you and your ministering team. I like that title, ministering team. Who have brought the good news of our Lord Jesus, saving grace to our beloved residents. You can see a photograph with a lot of people on the wheelchair. It is an honor and privilege for Lion's Home to serve as a venue for the extension of God's kingdom. This lady, Doreen Lai, is a Christian. And I have known her two decades ago. And she, I have not seen her for quite some time, but I think Brother Jeremiah and his team know her very well. Of course, I would urge the Gethsemane Bible Presbyterian Church to continue your ministry, both in Bedok and Bishan. We started in Bedok, and then they moved. Uh, they had a work in Topayo, and then now in Bishan, and so we go there. We had no negative feedback regarding your visits thus far. Praise the Lord. We will certainly be open to share with you if there is any. I can tell you, once we started this, many BP churches followed our path to go to Old Folks Home to minister. There, when we take care of them, you know, Jesus once said, I've been prison. You have visited me. I was hungered. You fed me. I was naked. You dressed me, right? You clothed me. This is not talking about, you know, 
go, you, you go to prison and, and be nice to people. This is about taking care of God's people. Whatever you do, even a cup of water you give to the least of my brethren, you do it unto me. That's Jesus' principle. And we must do that. The, God, the children whom God gave, whether healthy or unhealthy children, or whether intelligent or not so intelligent, we must take care of them as God-given children to us. And in the love of Christ, we must minister to them. If we have Christians, people in great distress and trouble, we must reach out and not just being charitable, but introduce Christ to them. Jesus is that which fills the lives of many who have been troubled by demons and all other problems. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Gethsemane BP Church must be a mother to Christ and a brethren of Christ. In other words, we will be tender. We will be loving for the gospel's sake. And we will do all things as it is unto the Lord. And that's our honor. That's our privilege. And how to be in that relationship? Jesus gives us the answer in verse 50. Let's come to the close of this message. And we are going to have Holy Communion soon. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and my mother. Wow. Whosoever shall do the will of my Father. You are brought to God the Father not by your merits, but by the goodness of Christ, who lived a perfect life on our behalf and took our sins and paid a perfect sacrifice that God's just wrath against us may be satisfied. And when God's just wrath is appeased, we are given forgiveness and we are reconciled to God. And now we can know God, the creator of all mankind, as our Father. And we go to Him as His children and find His will in our life. And when we yield to do His will, no matter what situation He would place us, we will do it as it is unto Him. For we know what He wants us to do through His Word. If God gave me a difficult family, and I want to be there as an obedient child of God, if God made me a widow, or widower, or an orphan, or God made me a... a a sick person or a mother with sick children, what way it be? Or if God give me a group of very handicapped people in our church, how about if we have 50 people coming into this church all on wheelchair? Will you say, oh, what a nonsense, this Pastor Goshi, Ay. always trouble, bring all these people into church. There are some people who have this attitude. They can't put up with the weary and sad and weak and frail. They want all these glittering, you know, characters around, glamorous, famous people around them. Care ministry has been a very special ministry that we had. Lion's Home Ministry was a very special ministry to, we had. In fact, sometimes I think we must extend our old folks ministry to such a level that there will be a place where people who are lonely, you know, a lot of old people, disoriented, they don't know what they are doing. If we can bring them together, preach the gospel, make them sing Christian hymns every day, and rejoice in the goodness of God, it's a good ministry. Not for money-making purpose. But who will come to do that work? Who will have a heart? 
I tell you who will have. Those who seek the will of the Father. Because God's will is so glorious. That which you were scared to do, he will help you to do. That which you were afraid ever to accomplish, he will help you to accomplish. But who will know Jesus and his Father? Who will seek his will? Who wants to be in relationship with God? You know, some of us don't want to get close to God. Some of us don't want to seek His will because we are scared. He may ask me to leave my job. He may ask me to do what I don't want to do. I know of people who don't want to hear good Bible teaching because they want to live the way they want to live. Because they are confronted by the message. They want to unsettle themselves. They want to break away from a good church, from a good teaching ministry, because their lifestyle is confronted. They don't want to, will, they want, they don't want to do the will of the Father. To you, I say this. You have a garnished house without a relationship with Christ. It's going to be made ugly even worse with the return of the devil, with more wicked demons. Let us not seek for something glamorous in the eyes of man, but let's get close to our Savior, where, the, where we are taught by him to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If I can be a servant of thine, by knowing your will, thy will be done on earth. But through who? But by his servants, whom he called my mother. Will I be a mother for Christ's sake in this world? Will I be a father to some for Christ's sake? Will I be a brother or a sister to someone, for Jesus' sake. Christians, get seminates. Seek not a religion, but seek to do the will of your Father. For his sake, a mother. For his sake, a brother. And you'll be amazed how the kingdom of God will flourish through us. To this you are saved. To this you are empowered. To this the Spirit has come to give us the spiritual gifts. May God be praised.